75. Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. Our next major milestone is 200 Patreon supporters. We are only 75 Patreon supporters away from achieving this goal and getting ever more closer to our overall goal of starting a nonprofit. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Cinco's or a jackhammer chatterbait, all weekend warriors will receive 5% off all of their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 10% off their orders to Tiger Crankbaits, and we have a special announcement. We have a new sponsor of the Patreon program, Catoctin Creek Rods. You'll receive 10% off your orders to Catoctin Creek Rods. You'll also gain access to our private Facebook group community. You'll be in the running for weekly Patreon giveaways, our monthly photo contest that we do every single month, and of course, members only content and so much more. If you would like to help Fishing the DMV grow bigger and better every single month to be part of a fantastic community that represents Virginia, Maryland, and the surrounding area, please check out the link down below. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and today we have a really special guest. I have been able to, through my connections and also being on the Black Bass Advisory Board for Maryland, I have talked to pretty much all the heads of state in Virginia, all the regional directors of Virginia in Maryland. I've kind of just gone through the totem pole. I've gone through Joe Love. Uh, I've gone through uh, so many fantastic people at the Maryland Department of Wildlife Resources, whether it's for Deep, Cray, uh, Deep, <laughs> Deep Creek Lake um, the flathead situation on the upper Potomac. And then, uh, this gentleman I have with me here, we, we got some fun things to talk about today, including the smallmouth stocking program. Uh, Michael, just, if you could just introduce yourself and, and how'd you get into this? Sure. So my name is Michael Kashiwagi. I'm the regional manager for the freshwater fisheries program for Frederick County, Washington County, and the upper Potomac river. I've been with Maryland DNR for 16 years now. I started originally with the Resource Assessment per Service, the Maryland Biological Stream Survey. Uh, it's kind of a statewide survey that does a lot of work in kind of small stream systems, uh, doing benthic and both fit fish, benthic and water chemistry work. And then six years ago, I transitioned over to the Freshwater Fisheries Program uh, into this regional manager role. I'm originally from Maryland, kind of oh, the cool. Gaithersburg, Rockville area. So I grew up fishing kind of the Seneca area when I was younger. I did a lot of canoeing down there as well. And then uh, went to college, got a degree in biology, and then I went and got a master's degree in fishery science from uh, Mississippi State University. What led you down that route when you decided, you know, in high school and college, like, this is the, this is how I want to go. It was pure accident. <laughs> uh, I didn't even know that this type of position existed. Um, to be honest, uh, I kind of initially was thinking more of kind of the veterinary route, um, hmm. and actually worked in veterinary hospitals in college and after college, but just kind of didn't didn't fit right exactly i've always been interested in fishing and fish since you know a very young age and then uh i just happened to take actually a course at frostburg state university they have a theology class out there that's taught taught by dr rich raisley he's actually still at frostburg university frostburg state university and i, I love the class it was you know great we did a lot of stuff in the lab but also a lot of field work uh, so we would go out do did some sampling surveys i loved it um and then started pursuing it more more seriously at that point and got accepted at mississippi state university went down there for two and a half years um i was working on all sorts of things down there we did um work on uh, Gulf Coast walleye, did stream surveys, did catfish work on the Mississippi, uh, hmm. um, paddlefish work on the Tennessee Ton Big B waterway, all That's kinds of cool projects. So uh, yeah, that, that was radio tracking work for paddlefish, looking at their movement patterns 
and kind of uh, the Tennessee Tom Big Bay, Tom Big Bay waterways on the Pencil, or the sorry Pen Mississippi Alabama border, and it has a series of locks and reservoirs. And we were kind of seeing how the paddlefish move between those uh, sections. They're endangered species, correct? Uh, it depends on the state. In that area, ah. they're not. There's actually a small fishery for them in certain areas. Hmm. Um, they're not. They're not in the, the Mid Atlantic at all. They're, they're super cool fish to see, um, prehistoric looking almost, and they can get huge in size. And you know, five, six feet is not is is possible. Um, yeah, they're very. It's kind of a totally different species that exists uh, in the southern U.S. Because it's like a it's like a mini basking shark or whale shark, right? Just how it feeds on zooplankton and things of that ilk. Yeah, it has a big kind of the paddle in front in front of its, um, you know, that protrudes out helps it maintain its stability as it's kind of coasting or gliding through the water. Yeah, and it, it filter feeds exclusively on zooplankton and plankton that are that's in the water column. So from college did you always want to after after you finished up to come back to maryland or was that like a, a luck of the draw you had to apply and, and you were lucky enough to get in maryland that, that was a luck of the draw i was actually working after after graduate school i worked in massachusetts for two years uh and just by pure chance my contract was running out in massachusetts and the position was a, was advertised in Maryland with the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, uh, I applied and then was able to move back to the state. So I had no in initial intention of moving back to Maryland, but I'm, I'm glad it worked out that way. That's really freaking cool. And so from there, you get to come back here to, to Maryland. And I think that kind of ties into, uh, and eventually I guess we're going to get to the whole, the smallmouth thing. And, and before we get right into the PowerPoint, I guess I want to set the stage for people that aren't aware like how this all came to be and, and when this program started. So I, I believe at the time when the smallmouth hatchery program was just a thought, were you at that point a regional manager or was that something that you got into as the program was already up and running? The, the, I was actually a regional manager before the program started. So um, the freshwater fisheries program monitors the fi multiple fisheries in the upper Potomac River on an annual basis. And those surveys go back to the you know the late mid mid uh, 1980s the, the boat electrofishing survey so we have a, you know, a very good uh, set of data the historical data through the present so we can kind of keep an eye and look at trends over time and prior to 2018 we were seeing a slight decreasing trend in smallmouth bass juvenile recruitment so recruitment means the new set new fish that are entering the population. So every year, smallmouth bass are going to spawn in the you know late spring, early summer. And those those fish that enter that year are considered that year's year class. Those fish are going to recruit over time into the fishery. So prior to 2018, we've been seeing low juvenile recruitment for a number of consecutive years. And then in 2018, we got hit uh, with a really high flow event in late May, early June. And that had a real, that as a result of that, we had zero, practically zero recruitment for that year. So high flows that coincide with spring spawning events can have a major impact to that specific year's, year, year class strength. So high flows, you know, destroy nests if they're any fry that have emerged from those nests during that high flow event, they're, they're immediately washed downstream. They can't kind of, they don't have the swimming ability to kind of uh, maintain their position. They're, they're just swept downstream. In addition, the high turbidity that accompanies those high flow events makes it very hard for them to feed and successfully get, you know, prey items during that time period. So there's very high mortality associated with, um, those types of events either during or immediately following the spawn. I've had Jason Halliker of uh, the Virginia DWR who kind of runs the Shenandoah Valley, Shenandoah River and Mark Frondorf of the Shenandoah River Keepers. And it's interesting, like that's the big thing. There, there, there's a whole lot of issues with the poor Shenandoah, but one of them was the 2018, 2019 high water events. So on top of that and the water quality issues, it nuked the Shenandoah. Right. Um, 
now the Shenandoah is an interesting case, but I do have listeners that are in Virginia. How bad was the high water mark compared, I guess, to the Shenandoah? Was it, I mean, clearly it was evident that it did do some destruction in the years after. Yeah, oh, for sure. And the one thing um, I want to also mention too is we've started to look at the historical flow data over time. So the U.S. Geological Survey has flow gauges out there. I'm sure most folks are familiar with, and a lot of those gauges go back, like the Point of Rocks gauge. Go, the data goes back over 100 years. So we have a huge time series worth of information to look at. And so we started to look specifically at comparing flow regimes um, for a given year inter time periods. So we kind of looked at. Um, it was 2010 prior versus 2010 to the present. And if you look at those flow regimes, particularly the spring flow regimes, they're statistically different. So within the last few years, we've been seeing higher May mean median May, May flows than we have been seeing in the past based off of the flow information. So that's a trend that's concerning, uh, especially if that continues moving forward. It means we're seeing higher flow events in May, early June, which unfortunately co coincide with, you know, prime spawning season for smallmouth bass and a lot of other game fish species as well. And you touched on this, but just uh, for the repetitive nature of a podcast, it's also the what it does to the environment and the habitat where you know, your, your sub your SAV, your subaquatic vegetation that gets completely blown out too. And then that also creates this this deadly cycle in the environment. Yeah, I mean, only now, uh, 2022, 2023, have we started to see some of the SAV coming back in areas. It completely uh, kind of just wiped it out from huge sections of the river where, um, you know, prior to 2018, there would be dense patches in the Seneca area, White's Ferry. I mean, there's numerous areas where there was really good SAV beds. And that, that's great habitat for both game fish, prey species, and benthic insects, benthic aquatic insects. So it's a key component to the kind of aquatic ecosystem. And when it's just completely wiped out like that, it's going to take a number of years for it to slowly recover. And we're only starting to see that now. Yeah, and that's something I think we'll circle back circle back to once we get to the flathead portion because I think it's interesting that now that the I see a lot more vegetation up at four locks and, and big slack dam four and five, and I'm also seeing more brim now than I ever did before. And I think it's interesting where you had this perfect cocktail of suck where the vegetation was gone and then you had the flathead in there and it just the the poor brim and a lot of these bait fish it just limited their ability to hide. Right, sure. They could get picked. There's, they had to hunker down kind of with, with any type of cobble or, or hard surface substrate that they could find. I think with the SAV coming back, they'll find more safety in those types of patches for sure. So, uh, well, uh, one thing I do want to mention too, um, it kind of highlights the importance of flow, uh, uh, spawning success and flow in, yeah. um, in Colorado, uh, in some of the, uh, watersheds where they have um, large reservoirs and to in, out in, in that portion of, of the U.S., smallmouth bass is kind of considered an invasive species, uh, ironically. Uh, it has wild. Yeah, it has detrimental impact to some of the native species out there. And actually, resource agencies out there, as a management strategy, they plan their high flow releases from some of these reservoirs to coincide with smallmouth bass spawning periods to control smallmouth bass populations. They found it to be their most effective management tool hmm. in keeping smallmouth bass numbers in check to help protect the native species that, that, that they're tasked with managing. So it's kind of, it, it highlights the importance of Flow events and spawning success. Uh, obviously, in, in this area, we're, we're, it's kind of the reverse. We we want to see successful spawning events in the spring, and we don't want to see those major high flow events. But it kind of highlights the importance uh, that they have in, in kind of uh, maintaining that fishery. 
That's freaking fascinating. God, that's really cool. So setting the stage, then you have the, you have the two, the two bad years, like 2018, 2019, you do your survey, you realize there's an issue and you know, the listeners of this show, we've talked about like the Virginia stocking program. And, um, I had Mulligan on two years ago to talk about the sh- the smallmouth one. So just a quick recap, then there's only like a handful of States in the United States that have actually successfully done this. I think South Carolina, which I did not have that on my bingo card as one of them is pretty damn good at it. How did you, how did this all start then when you're like, Hey, let's, let's take a crack at this. Okay. Good, good question. So, uh, we had done smallmouth bass spawning hatchery spawning in the past. This is probably 20 plus years ago, but we had not done anything, um, for a very long time. We, we, and actually, one of the kind of take home points from this project was we kind of passed along the institutional knowledge of doing it to the next generation of staff at the hatchery. That that was kind of an important component as well. Um, so in 2018, we had that major flow event. We realized we needed to try to do something to boost juvenile numbers. So we actually purchased smallmouth bass juveniles from a hatchery in Oklahoma uh, and brought them back into Maryland. They passed all the fish health testing uh, and they were stocked into the upper Potomac at a few uh, locations. We then reached out to our hatchery staff and worked with them in 2019 to start the the initial uh, attempt to raise fish and actually i'm if it's okay i'm going to share a presentation that i have um put together this was given to the black bass advisory commission i think it'd be it'd be helpful to go through it maybe in a little bit more detail so kind of just for 2023 this is just a brief overview um This was the fifth year of the project, the supplemental stocking project. And the one of the key components again to the project has been angler participation. So we worked with a tournament coordinator on the upper Potomac and he, he was, you know, instrumental in recruiting and, uh, helping with the collection of broodfish for the hatchery. So we held, in 2023, we actually held two tournaments. One was at Brunswick and one was at Four Locks. I think we had probably 15 to 20 boats at each location. And it's a super efficient way for us to get a large number of adult smallmouth bass at one time. Um, so the, the coordinator holds the tournament as they you normally would. Boats go out early in the morning. They come back to the ramp around two or three in the afternoon. Uh, They held a weigh-in. And then the the fish from the weigh-in are immediately brought over to um, our hatchery truck. And staff from the hatchery can then try to determine if they're male or female. Uh, If they look good, we, you know, obviously put them in the truck to go back to the hatchery. Any excess fish that we don't need immediately go back into the river. So it, it worked very, very well. And through those tournaments, we were able to get roughly 60 to 70 fish that went back to three hatchery ponds um, at, at our Manning State Hatchery. That's in uh, Prince George's County. So they have roughly eight to 10 females per pond and then ideally one and a half to two times the number of males. So 16. When you say access fish, what were you looking for? Perfect world number wise to get back? Cause you, you stated earlier, like if you had access fish, you'd put them back. So I just didn't know if like perfect world, you had like a quota that you really wanted to get into your ponds. Yeah. Yeah. So each pond we were hoping to get roughly 25 fish. So if we had more, more than 75 fish collected, they could go back other times. Um, say we we had the number of females that we needed um so any extra females could just go back into the river we in some cases we actually in in all the cases we actually want more males than than females uh, in these ponds so that that was i mean that 
worked great. And I would highly recommend if other states or agencies are looking to collect brood to go the tournament route. Um, it worked great. The anglers were, you know, very enthusiastic to participate. And um, it was a great way to collect, you know, all the fish we needed in a, in a short period of time. A side tangent off this PowerPoint, everyone in the, a lot of the people in the bass fishing community talk about the Texas fish program and, and their lunker program. Is there anything to the idea of if you only bring back to your pond fish of a certain weight class that those genetics have a higher probability of trans or, or being passed on so that you in return could get bigger fish? And if, if that is true, what size would you be looking for in a perfect world to bring back? Uh, that's a good question. I think you, I mean, obviously we're looking at 60 to 70 fish for this whole hatchery project for a given year. So capturing, you know, the high end of the genetic diversity is probably unrealistic. We, we were just trying to get the, the quota number of fish that we needed. Um, gotcha. Obviously, larger females are going to produce more eggs than smaller females so mm. our main goal was to get large females just because we would get more eggs out of them um in terms of the male so two pound plus you around there three pound plus yeah if if possible and then males it, it was less important um we <laughs> just we would take any males that we could get we did not you know kind of selectively screen for larger males we just any males that we could get a hold of then we that we needed, we took. Gotcha. So it's about volume, getting things up to speed so, so we can get the bang for the buck. Correct. Yeah. So we have, we only had three, the, the manning facility only has a set number of ponds. Um, they need, they can only allocate three ponds for this project. Uh, they're needed in the springtime for other fish species. Uh, so we needed to try to, generate the most number of juveniles from gotcha. those three ponds that that was the, the how, ultimate goal how many ponds are how many ponds are under your control just to be able to allocate to different things uh, they probably have 10 to 15 ponds down there but they use them for you know walleye production different shad oh, wow. species they have a whole host of uh, largemouth bass bluegill um so they have to there's a meeting in the in the winter to kind of a pre-production meeting to kind of lay out what ponds are going to be used for what species or what project um and we were lucky that we were able to get three ponds for for this work now as a side note fascinating the virginia department of, of fish and game they have i think a new hatchery in the front front row row. area yeah and that's as far as I know, that's dedicated ex almost exclusively to smallmouth bass production. But they had funding from I think it's um, Dupont Settlement. Correct. So yeah. they had they had a very specific kind of funding source uh, allocated for that hatchery and the specific project, specific I don't know, uh, designed for it. And yeah, uh, I, we just, we I just had Halliker on the show. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had Halliker on the show to talk about that. So people that don't know, it was a lawsuit based on the whole bleep show that was the Shenandoah river and DuPont was, uh, kind of in the middle of that. And the, the lawsuit settlement was in the magnitude of millions and millions of dollars. They had so much that could be allocated to front Royal just for the audience to be kind of caught up on that whole fun drama. Right. Right. So th that's a, between the two states, it's a little bit different scenario in the fact that they had dedicated funding for that. For Maryland, we did not have dedicated funding specific to this. We just kind of had to make adjustments and use the facilities and um, kind of space that we, we had available to us. Was it hard to get funding or did you guys have to open up a lemonade stand? Like, how did that? No. Was the, that? Oh, yeah. But there was a <laughs> good question. Uh, we kind of just kind of squeezed and uh, figured it out along the way. Uh, luckily, the hatchery staff are, are super flexible, and um, 
they, they were interested in the project as well. So they kind of uh, were, were able to, you know, allocate resources to help. That's freaking I, awesome. Yeah. But it was, and, and I want to stress too, too, uh, that each, even though you have say three ponds to work with, each pond just as their their very nature there's a tremendous amount of variability between each pond even though they could be directly next to each other for whatever reason they just behave slightly differently um and for this year for 2023 springtime conditions were such that temperatures kind of like as we're experiencing now <laughs> Uh, we had some very warm days followed by some cool days, by, followed by, the temperatures were kind of varied all over the place. And as a result, in 2023, we had kind of limiting, limited spawning success. I think two of, two of the three ponds worked out great. One pond, for whatever reason, the fish just didn't cooperate and no spawning occurred. Um, and we'd seen this before, unfortunately. Uh, that's one of the things that make smallmouth bass juvenile production so difficult. Uh, largemouth bass, in comparison, are very, very easy and very amenable to spawning in ponds. Um, you, you put, you know, five bass, largemouth bass in the pond, and you're almost guaranteed you'll have sp some spawning occurring. Smallmouth bass are much more finicky. Um, they want kind of the ideal conditions for them to spawn if they don't get them they'll just hold off and, and not do anything so that, that's one of the, how much is the lack of current that could be it? some of it uh they try to generate some current in these ponds by having uh an hmm. inflow of water to try to generate some flow but uh and again the, the ponds were set up with gravel substrate uh kind of cobbles spawning beds were put in there so each pond had you know six to ten pre-built nests you know placed in them that the fish could use but uh it's just kind of luck of the draw if they'll actually cooperate and, and spawn on those areas and, it's great. and and i believe and i believe it's slide two or three that kind of gets into the the, the numbers oh, yeah. uh, let mistaken. me advance it to the next one so this this kind of highlights uh, what, what i'm we're referring to um so this is kind of the five years of the project 2019 um those were the fish that um oh i'm, I'm sorry 2019 we we had fish in the ponds, but very limited spawning success. Um, they just did not cooperate. Um, 2020, three ponds again, and then really good success. Uh, conditions were such that we were able to produce 35,000 fingerlings. So, what, what, Ooh, could you switch yeah, slides? So when, when I'm talking about fingerlings, those are the ones on the, on the, the upper photo there. They're roughly two inches in size. Um, okay. They're um, and they're stocked out at, um, at that size back into the river. So 2020, good success. 2021, we had good success in the ponds. Unfortunately, in the process of moving the fish from the ponds to the indoor raceways, we had an aerator fail. So an aerator is something that keeps the water oxygenated. Uh, we lost, unfortunately, a large number of fish um, due to that equipment failure. So we only had a thousand to stock out. 2022, again, great success, 38,000. Mm. And then 2023, 15,000. You know, two of the three ponds work, one did not. Um, and the other thing, too, is th these smallmouth bass are also very cannibalistic in a hatchery environment if you have a smallmouth bass that's at the juvenile stage that's slightly larger than its brothers and sisters it will start to eat <laughs> those fish so you can only keep them in a hatchery for 
so long. The, the hatchery staff want to, once they reach you know two inches in the minimum size, or ma- they want to get them out of there as fast as possible before you have one or two of them get larger and uh, you see your production numbers start to go down because they start actually eating each other. So that's that's another issue too with trying to raise smallmouth bass uh, in a hatchery setting. But over overall, uh, for the five years of the project, we stocked out roughly 91,000 fish into the river. Uh, and that was mainly in the middle and lower sections. So we, we divide the river up into kind of three distinct areas. The, the lower Potomac, lower section is from Seneca Breaks to Harper's Ferry. The middle section would be Harper's Ferry to Dam 5. And the upper section would be Dam 5 to Cumberland. And the areas where where we've seen the lowest juvenile recruitment the past oh, eight to 10 years has been in that middle and lower sections of the river. So those were the areas that we primarily targeted for stocking to try to boost uh, recruitment in those areas and kind of improve uh, juvenile numbers um, th- through the supplemental stocking. And one thing I do want to note, um, in 2023, we were actually able to... And then if you could switch to the next slide, oh, that'd sure. be good too. Uh, this go. one? Or... Well, right now I'm seeing slide one. Uh, is it, are you seeing this one? It should have a list of numbers. Nope, I'm not seeing one. that one. <laughs> I am still seeing slide one. Let me try to do some work here hold on let me see if i can stop sharing and let me try this let's see if that does it let's try it again one second Hmm. Is that working? Can you see the PowerPoint? Thomas, can you see the PowerPoint? I can. Is it? Is it the list of perfect. numbers? Okay, yes, it perfect. is. Now it is. Um, and then uh, one thing I want, did want to note for 2023, uh, we were able to chemically mark the juveniles before they were stocked. So uh, OTC is oxytetracycline. It's a um, a compound that you can dilute in water. You then place the juveniles into that water bath for a given period of time. And it actually lays a chemical marking in their inner ear bone, their otolith. Um, So those fish are then stocked out in the river. We can collect a subsample of juveniles in our fall electrofishing surveys, uh, remove that inner ear bone and then it actually fluoresces under UV light. So you can see if the fish was from a hatchery origin or if it was a wild fish. And of uh, so we, we all the fish were marked. We only really subsampled the uh, juveniles at two locations, Point of Rocks and uh, White's Ferry. But of the fish that we collected there, roughly 6 to 10% were of hatchery origin. So that's that's a good indication that the stocking was having a, you know, a positive impact in the fishery. One side note, in 2023, we did see a very strong year class of, of fish. So that means that there was good natural reproduction in the river. But in years where you had limited 
natural reproduction, I would expect to see that marking. If, and we did the marking, you would expect to see the hatchery numbers to represent a higher portion uh, of juvenile fish. And, and I think that's the idea with this. When, when people talk about stocking a big body of water, it's supplemental. And it's the idea of like your, and this is what I thought was interesting from when you listen to people like in the Texas uh, wildlife system is like, you're just trying to make sure that the lows just aren't as low, which is really hard. Yes. In rivers. Yeah. We, this hatchery stocking will never um, be as successful as wild reproduction. Um, but it's kind of an insurance policy that, say we in 2023 we did have a high flow event in may or june the hatchery stocking would have been a major factor to help kind of maintain that fishery if, if an event like that did occur luckily we had good natural reproduction so um, stocking just kind of bumps up what's actually occurring naturally in the system but again yeah that's a perfect example where um it's a supplemental project or supplemental stocking to the fishery and it, it will never kind of be as successful as, as wild reproduction. W with that said, and this is something you probably already touched on, but I just want to make sure you reiterate it again. What made you decide on the locations in which you oh, would okay, stock? Good. So in those locations uh, in the middle and lower section is where we'd seen low levels of juvenile recruitment the past several years. So uh, in addition to our uh, boat electrofishing surveys, we also do seine surveys during the summer. So seine is kind of a fine mesh net. It's 30 feet long and it's used primarily to collect minnows and juvenile fish. So it lends itself perfectly to looking for um, juvenile recruitment numbers. So we have kind of a series of established stations along the course of the river that we go to every year. And we're, we're looking specifically to try to collect juvenile smallmouth bass from those, the, those sites. And in sites where we collected few or very few um, smallmouth bass over the past several years, those are the areas that we wanted to target specifically with the supplemental stocking. Cause it's interesting. Cause like you talk about like the, the, the lower, the middle. And again, guys, that'd be like from the break down to the, the Seneca section. And then the middle section would be up to Harper's Ferry, Harper, Harper. I'm sorry. Middle section is Harper's Ferry up to like really the dam at, at big slack. And then you go all the way up from there to all the way to Hancock and, and Paul Paul area. Does that have anything to do with also the habitat? Is the habitat different in the upper section comparatively to the yes, middle? Yes, it would be. So when you get above dam five, so kind of four locks, uh, McCoy's Ferry, Hancock, Little Orleans, Paw Paw. Um, you have really good habitat. In some of those areas you have really good habitat conditions. Um, dam four downstream. Uh, sometimes the hab you have good areas of habitat and some areas of not great habitat. Um, it just depends where you're located at. And then further down in the lower section, like Point of Rocks is great habitat, but Edwards Ferry and some other areas down there, the habitat is not as good. Um, so there, there's, you know, a good variety or good variability in habitat conditions uh, for each of those three areas. And it, uh, obviously, and good. also too, as you work your way mm -hmm. downstream, the size of the river grows as well so once you get below harper's ferry you have the influence of the shenandoah the confluence. <laughs> excuse me coming in it just gets a lot bigger um from there downstream right. so you get to 2023 20, oh, i'm no. sorry you're gonna say something oh so 2023 you've hit ninety one thousand. um put in you redo all your surveys and what was the conclusion then at the end of okay, this five years? So I'm going to, does this, did you see the next slide? I am still on the smallmouth stocking numbers. Uh, there, there we go. There we go. Okay. See it. Perfect. Smallmouth monitoring. So um, as part of our 
fall electrofishing surveys, um, we look at the catch rates of different sized fish. And these are kind of standard measurements uh, in the United States. And one of them is, is what's called quality size fish. It's fish greater than 11 inches in size. And this is a plot of our catch rates for those quality small quality size smallmouth bass. And this is fish per hour as part of an electrofishing survey. And if you look for most of, say, 2007 through 2018, we're, we're doing really well. We're in the 30 to 40 fish per hour range. Now, there's the two dashed lines that are going horizontally across the graph represent, the gray represents the 75th percentile and the yeah, orange represents the 25th percentile of our, our survey numbers. So we want to keep our catch rates of quality size fish above that 25th percentile line, that orange line. That's roughly 18 fish per hour. So as you can see, we, we were expecting this, unfortunately, in 2019, in 2020 in particular, we dropped below that 25th percentile uh, cutoff. And we kind of were expecting that based off of the low recruitment numbers we'd seen the prior three to five years. But luckily in 2021, 22, and then 23, we, we bumped back up. So we're now above that 25th percentile kind of that's used as kind of like a management um, action um, number. So once we drop below that 25th percentile, we want to try to do like potentially implement some type of management action to improve it. Um, but in 2020, it, it's fascinating because between mm -hmm. no, a, a so in 2021, hole. 2022 and 2023, we, we bumped back up um, and based off of some of our recruitment, score numbers, we expect that to stay above that 25th percentile cutoff the next few years. So as a result of that information, we have decided to stop the supplemental program at this point in time for 2024. But that's not to say that if we drop back below that 25th percentile at some point in the future, that we wouldn't would not go back to we, we could potentially start that project back up again. So I definitely want to circle back to what that you just said there. But um, it is interesting when you look at between 2021 and 2023. And I know in I've been doing this show way too long. I think it's 2022. Um, the Brunswick winning weight was like 23 pounds for the best five. Um, yeah, Cause I had him on the show, but then when you look at that graph, it, it's interesting because you're doing the qu the quality size of our 11 inches. And so it wasn't as great in 2022 and 2023 as it was in 2021, but I'm pretty sure the best bag that came out of the, the upper Potomac was 2022. So it, it is interesting how it doesn't tell necessarily the whole story. Cause it, I guess it comes down to like anglers experience Correct. level, how good they're, they're catching them. What's out there. Like there are still some different sure, things. Sure. Th this is, this is all of the survey data for giving, fall kind of summarized into one one number or one statistic so th within that any given year there's going to be a lot of variability this is just kind of a way to look at the data in a summary form and kind of to highlight that as well i can talk about so this is um the next size category up it's called preferred size so this is smallmouth bass greater than 14 inches and this is probably what like tournament anglers in particular are targeting fish, you know, in this size range and above. And um, again, 2019 and 2020, we saw that drop, which we were expecting. But again, in 2021, 22 and 23, those numbers bumped back up. So we're above the 75th percentile in terms of our 
catch rates for those larger size fish. And one one thing I also wanted to bring up too, um, I don't have a I don't have a plot to show you, but we also get uh, angler data from our tournament reporting system. So if you hold a bass tournament on the Upper Potomac River, you have to apply for an, uh, a tournament permit. And as a condition of that permit, you have to submit your tournament results back to the agency. And the, one of the super interesting things is the when we summarize the tournament data the same way as we summarize our electrofishing data, the trends match almost perfectly. So if we have a drop in electrofishing catch rates for a given year, we also see that reflected in the tournament catch rates for that year. When we have, so when we have a, a very successful year like 2023, we had good um, catch rates for electrofishing catch rates for larger size fish. You saw the same thing in the tournament data. So the, the two of them are complementary. And it's a great way for us to kind of check our results versus what the anglers are reporting. And if they were to be off, that would be an area we'd want to look at more. But almost to a um, for, for any given year, they they match very very closely. So um, that's another great thing that when we get angler information back, particularly through that tournament reporting process, it, it helps us and kind of uh, manage the fishery as well. It is interesting that I think context always matters for things like this. And when, you know, I, I've talked when I had Joe Love on the show, and we talked about the different styles in in stocking programs. You know, he brought up that you just got to remember the size of Maryland. And when people always want to compare us to Texas, you have to understand that you could fit Maryland in Texas like ten thousand times. Like it's just it's a different animal when it comes to budget and bandwidth to get things done. And right. s but with all that said, you know, it's it's remarkable that you were able to you know, squeeze as much as you could out of the budget to make this happen for five years. And it definitely a hundred percent showed. Are, yeah, are yeah. you, are, are you worried about, you've gained so much data from this five year experience. Is there something there where it's like, are, are you worried that by not doing it anymore, you're going to lose the momentum that you have in, in this area of raising one of the hardest warm water species? No, actually, I think we helped secure it through this, uh, let me go to the next slide. Uh, so, okay. Yeah, one of the big benefits of actually doing this project um, over the past five years is within our hatchery, warm water hatchery program, there's been, just recently, there's been a number of retirements, folks who'd been there 20, 30 years. The folks who had actually done a lot of the smallmouth bass spawning work initially several decades ago and they were able to pass along their knowledge and experience to the newer hatchery staff members so uh, in that regard it was it was huge um, all that and the, and those new staff members were able to gain experience obviously doing it firsthand um, at the facility so just keeping that institutional knowledge going, was uh, I mean that was huge I think, um, and we retained the ability to do it again and start it up if need be because all the staff there now have participated in it and know the ins and outs and kind of issues that can arise um, from from this five year project. No, it's an absolute fascinating thing, and and I would like to also bring up with the Alabama bass situation in Virginia, luckily knock on wood, it hasn't gotten up here. Is that something that would be one area where if that arised, bringing back the small mouth program might be a valid option? Uh, that is a good question. I, that is hard to, hard to answer. Uh, luckily the Alabama bass situation has not popped up yet in Maryland. Um, and that is, a, in terms of an invasive species issue, it's different because it's a genetic issue as opposed to a lot of other times it's kind of a predation issue. Um, 
yeah, Alabama bass, if they were to become established in the upper Potomac River, would could potentially change the genetic uh, component of the smallmouth bass population. Could you maintain it specific, you know, through a hatchery program? Uh, I, I don't know. That's something I think would be difficult because you would have to ensure that you had a hundred percent kind of quote unquote pure smallmouth bass to work with. And I think they would probably just get swamped numerically in the river if you had an explosion of, of largemouth of Alabama bass in that system. That would be my guess. I've, I think it's an interesting mental exercise because I know with the F1s, you know, it's only that one generation that you're going to see the size and then the next generation, they're not going to have that. So in theory, if you did keep restocking the river with smallmouth, is there something where you can improve the genetics? So that way, the, the if you did have Alabama bass in there, you could do it or is it just like you said like it's just it's a financially it's just unfeasible that you can't balance out the genetic pool i think it would be probably unfeasible um it would just come down to numbers i mean we're talking on our best years producing 38 to forty thousand yeah. juvenile smallmouth bass if you had god knows what the actual number of wild fish that are spawned during a very successful year in, in the river, it would be orders of magnitude higher than that. Uh, so I think you, your Alabama bass genes, just purely based off of numbers and over time, would swamp the genes that you were put pushing out from your hatchery program. And, but, but, and I. I'm gl oh, go ahead. The, the, the main take home point for, with the Alabama bass is do not move fish <laughs> between water bodies. Uh, prevention is, you know, the most effective tool uh, on that front. If hopefully if, if Maryland and other states can keep Alabama bass out, that is going to be the most efficient management strategy um and that comes down to angler education and angler um understanding of what the threat and what the issue is it's also interesting because i had a uh, odenkirk and i also did an episode with uh steven um salmons S salmons of uh, clemson university and it looks like there is it's not a data point yet more of an observation that the Alabama bass cannot do not take root in grassy estuaries or fisheries. And that's why you don't see them take hold as well in Florida and, and uh, Gunnersville like Gunnersville. So that is a very interesting thing they have not done a study on, but it's just an observation. I think they like kind of the, Clear what water. I've read the meso oligotrophic yeah. lakes. And unfortunately like, rocky cobbly river systems yeah which sadly. is a, uh, which is a lot of what the upper potomac is um i know it, within virginia they're in a few reservoirs in the southern part of the state i think they're in the james um yeah that philpot james yeah yep. that's the extent of their northern distribution at the moment but yeah again please if you're an angler do not move any fish between water bodies if you catch something at a spot just either harvest it in your cooler or return it to the water do not put it live and transport it to somewhere else you are only opening up a huge you know can of worms that could cause a lot of problems down the road well, speaking of moving fish around, that's a fantastic segue to another invasive species. I had um, I had uh, a couple of people on to talk about this, particularly the flathead. Okay, um, yes. You have a study or, or you have a project going on this year, correct? Uh, yes. So um, flathead catfish are established in the Upper Potomac River. They've been there since in decent numbers since 2012. 
Um, for this year, uh, we know that they're increasing in both numbers, distribution, and size. So for this year, we have a tagging study planned for this summer. We'll be going out collecting flathead catfish. Many times we would collect them um, and remove them from the system to get inf information on their age and growth. But in this case, we're actually going to be inserting a, a dart tag along their dorsal fin uh, and then returning it to the water. So we're asking anglers, if they do catch a tagged fish, to please report it um, to freshwater fisheries. Each tag will have a phone number on it. It's actually this office phone number and a unique four digit number. So all you need to do is call that number, report the tag number from the fish, whether you harvested it um, or returned it to the water. We, we encourage harvest, obviously, where you caught it, when you caught it, and any size information that you might have. And then we'll, we'll, we'd be happy to provide the angler with our information too, where we caught the fish initially, uh, when we tagged it, what its size was at that time. Um, so if you catch it, you know, six, eight months down the road, you can see where it moved and how much it grew during that interval. What are you hoping, like, w w with that? How do you, once a species gets in there, whether it is Alabama, whether it's flathead, the blue cat thing, Lord knows how many talked, how many times I've talked about blue cats on this show. It, it, I don't, like, what is a logical, sensible way to actually get rid of them that makes sense? I mean, I know that there's a couple ideas that we'll talk about here, but it just feels like once they're in there, they're kind of in there. Yeah, that's, that's correct. It, unless you catch something very, very early, once it's just, like the flat is, is established in the upper Potomac, there's no way we could ever completely remove it from that system. We can encourage harvest, which could keep those numbers maybe in check and um, under some level of control. But again, with invasive species, the best is preventing its initial entry into any new system. That That is key and something that we kind of try to stress. Do not bring species, new species from out of state into Maryland and do not move fish, even within Maryland, do not move fish from one water body to another. Could you compare and contrast then what the the musky? Because I have had people in the comment section saying like, "Well, a musky is basically in, in, an invasive species, but it was stocked by you know the government." And like compare and contrast what a musky does to the, the the system versus a flathead. Okay, good good question. So a musky, yes, muskies are not native to to Maryland. They're a northern latitude species. They were. Uh, stocked. I mean, tiger muskies are, are still being stocked in some reservoirs in the state. Um, muskies got into the upper Potomac and they're naturally reproducing, but their numbers are much smaller. We've, we've done some population estimates and we estimate there's seven adult muskie, six to seven adult muskie per river mile in, in sections of the upper Potomac. So they're not hugely abundant. I, I could go, I mean, you could go to Shepherdstown now and you could probably get 25 flathead catfish within, you know, quarter mile of river fairly sure. easily. So we're talking in terms of abundances, we're talking of orders of magnitude different. I mean, muskie being very relatively low in terms of their numbers and flatheads being high and then increasing in number uh, over time. So uh, in that regard, the impact that flathead catfish are having compared to muskie is, you know, much, much higher. And it's also like, I would assume, um, again, uneducated uh, opinion here, it's how much they consume their caloric intake. It seems to be, ba ba again, anecdotally, and just yeah. talking from angles I mean, we species, flathead we'll, or a vacuum cleaner. We'll get flathead in our surveys, and um, you'll find, you know, multiple brim other species in their stomachs. And they, the one thing in the summer, their metabolism is super, super high. 
So they're consuming a lot of prey items and they're being digested almost immediately. So they go through, a, they have the potential to consume a lot of fish um, very quickly. And that ties into also the perfect storm of the high water events we had in 2019, where you get rid of all that SAV and then it just, it really is just a perfect cocktail of suck for the ecosystem. Right. So, yeah. So a lot of those smaller fish species have no place, no SAV to hide in. They're out swimming around. You have, you know, any decent sized flathead that it encounters is going to swallow it up pretty quickly, pretty easily. That's awesome stuff. Um, and then I think you have a, a, a survey, uh, two surveys that I want to make sure that we cover. I think it's the musky volunteer angler survey and the creel clerk survey. Y yes. So uh, along those lines of the musky uh, monitoring, we have a volunteer uh, angler survey. Um, we're looking for any musky anglers who are, might be interested in participating. Over the past few years, we've had some of our, our dedicated folks who've done that in the past move move out of state. So we're trying to kind of recruit new folks who might be interested in participating. We just ask the, the angler to kind of keep track of the number of trips that they go out targeting muskie and the number of fish that they potentially catch. They can report that at the end of the year and they'll get um, a hat, some muskie stickers and other items that and it, that we, we generate um, an annual report. And then in 2025, we're working to try to set up a Creel survey on the Upper Potomac. We've never done one of these before for that system. It'd be kind of a roving Creel survey where we'd have a Creel clerk that would be going to various boat ramps to interview anglers. Um, they'd be asking questions on kind of what species are you targeting? What species are you harvesting? Um, how much time do you fish at a given location? Uh, the, the, a whole series of questions. Each, um, so we're asking anglers if they'd be, if they're approached by a creel clerk to you know please participate in that survey. It's valuable information that that helps us manage the the different fisheries. One more thing I really wanted to just get your um, views on and help me understand is how is the how is the budget allocated for let's say put and take trout versus uh, warm water species versus cold water species when it comes to your pond stocking is it all thrown into one pot or is it just is it automatically separated out? There, there's we get funding. Well, the three there's two main sources of kind of revenue for the for our group uh, we get federal funds and we also get license funds so those those come from license fees um, how they're broken down at least for federal funds they're specific kind of tasks and projects that we have to complete um, and we get funding uh, and have to do reports and, and follow-ups uh, for each of those tasks uh, I don't know the budget side of things as well. That's kind of handled by other staff in Annapolis. Uh, so I couldn't, you know, answer specifically if license fees go specifically to musky work or uh, if that's more of a federal funded portion. Is that the purpose of the trout stamp then? The trout stamp is, you know, that's used specifically for rearing of trout. Yes, but, but I think federal funding also is needed to um, add to that as well. So it's a, I think for that, it's a combination. Yeah, and this is something, and that's why I thought in my research, because it's something I will be bringing up at the Black Bass Advisory Board, is why states don't do a black bass stamp or something like that to help not only generate money, but have a data point. Cause I going, cause I have no time on my hands. Uh, I go through stuff. And when you look at a fishing license, that's kind of vague when it comes, I mean, you can do surveys and stuff, but it, it's such a, if you're going to do hunting, you can, you're very, you're very granular in what you're, what you're going to go shoot versus a freshwater fishing license. It's a lot harder for you to get at the data points of, well, how many, what is the percentage of people doing what? so we can make sure we, we stock that. Yeah, they, they've done some surveys in the past, kind of statewide, 
mailing surveys where they look at angular preference and angular response, but that's usually kind of um, over a larger geographic area. The purpose of the upper Potomac Creel survey is to get specific and in angular information from that one water body. Uh, Michael, I really appreciate your time. And it's fantastic to be able to get the word out about, I mean, it is, it's an absolute massive success story to take a, a fish species that is a pain to, to raise and to show that this can be done. Um, is this something that do you feel like other states can copy and implement in the future? Basically this template you guys laid out. Yeah, I think they could. I think Virginia is going down that road. Um, they have that hatchery that's you know up in production now. Um, I think it can be done. Um, each year is going to be kind of hit or miss if you're successful or not. That's just the nature of trying to work with smallmouth bass. But I think um, in terms of a supplemental program, it, it could be done and implemented by, by other agencies. Is there anything else that we need to cover or uh, anything that we have? Because we've covered a lot today, so we'll make sure we get everything in. No, no, no. I think we, we've talked about a bunch. Um, again, if folks have specific questions, they can contact me directly. Um, just do a quick search on Maryland DNR web webpage. There's a freshwater fishing Webpage page has links to the, the West two region that's what we're responsible for, or they can just email me directly. It's michael.kashwagi at maryland.gov. I'm happy to answer any angler questions that come in. And, and Thomas, I appreciate the, the invitation to, to come on the podcast and present this information. And, uh, you know, I'd be happy to come back at any point in the future to, to talk about other issues or, or topics as the, um, as they come up. I would love to hear about the flathead movement data once you get that data in, because that is going to be fascinating to see kind of their movement patterns, especially I'm assuming ground zero is like that four locks, um, Williamsport area. Um, I, I, I could be off, but that that's fascinating to me. Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd be happy to do that probably maybe fall or winter of this year. Once we get some initial results back in, but, um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see, our results as well. Um, I think we're going to see more of them than we're, than we're expecting. That's my initial initial thought. Yeah, me too. Um, as always, guys, I'm going to put a link in the episode description, like I always do, to everything that we talked about, including the DWR contact information. So if you see if you see something out in the water, please see something, say something. Those are really our first responders to anything illegal that's happening out there. Like and subscribe to the channel; it really helps us out in the algorithm. And we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.